All right, y'all, thank you for joining us for episode six. Last episode, we saw Jay walking up, shaking hands with El Chapo. El Chapo asking him what he could help him with. Hope you're enjoying the series. Please subscribe to the channel. Here we go. Every kilo someone stole, every kilo someone lost, someone paid pay for it. It might not have been with drug money. It might have been paid with your mom's house. Mm -hmm. But someone paid for it. Get it back in blood. Or, or their life. Yeah. Just kill him yeah. and weave. And weave it. If you are a different character-wise, they might have created a problem. Because if they see that your temperament is aggressive, you think you can fuck it up. Absolutely. Same way his father looked at their older brother when he was doing all the game banging stuff when the father came out of jail. He looked at him like he's going to ruin it. He looked at him like, that's punk stuff, that game banging. Ain't no money in that. That's a bum on a the corner. These people look, they see you a hothead. If you're a hothead, they realize, hey, man, this guy, this guy's going to mess things up. This person's lack of emotional control is going to ruin this system. And that's the last thing people need. Jay and Pete found a business partner in a man named Guadalupe, or Lupe, who they called Uncle. Dear Lupe, you turncoat. He became a close family friend of the twins, but things started to unravel after Lupe tried to take over the twins' business. Lupe blamed them for a debt he owed to Chapo. So Chapo kidnapped Pete until the money could be paid. Jay had to take a journey to straighten things out. For Jay, just coming face to face with El Chapo is insane. But your brother's life is hanging in the balance. One wrong word could instantly end both of your lives. For Chapo, execution is part of his daily routine, the same way you or I might check our emails every day. Jay's mission was to convince the world's most notorious drug lord that Lupe, the man that Chapo trusted and had a long-standing business relationship with, was the one who was lying to him. Lupe hung those boys out to dry in front of Chapo. Chapo reaches out his hand and he let Paul King Guzman Loera and tell him my name, Margarita Flores. He's just staring at me. Dry stare, just staring at me. And I'm like trying to like, give me back my hand a little bit. And so how could I help you? I said, well, sir, I'm here because um, I'm here for my brother. Yep. Mm. You have my $10 million? And I said, well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. They're like, I don't owe ten million dollars. Everyone says that. And I said, I'm here to just kind of try to work this out with you. And I've been, you know, a good customer for many years. And I don't owe that money. And I'm here to see if I could work something out for my brother. And he's like, why would I believe that you don't owe that money? Guadalupe says you owe that money. And... I believe him. He's a friend of mine. Well, sir, Guadalupe is supposed to be my tío, partner of mine, and uh, he's putting me in the lion's mouth right now. I said, well, sir, I mean, I wouldn't lie to you. And he's like, this is starting to be a headache. <laughs> and I'm just quiet. Happy for who? And he said, your brother, he's your twin brother. You guys look alike? I said, yeah. And I said, we look alike. And he's like, you made it here, like, what do you want? Like, you came up here, and I have your brother. You know I could just kill you and go about my day, right? I said, yes, sir. I said, but that's why I'm here. I wouldn't come up here wasting your time with a lie. I'm a man of my word, and I thought that that would make the difference. And he said, that's fair. I said, can I just explain it to you? And he said, sure, all right, come on. And he sat down in his chair. He went around, sat down in his chair, and went on the table. And I sat down the other side, and I grabbed the ledgers. And he's just staring. Came with receipts. And I mean, I said, so look, um, I'm confused because, you know, I thought that Guadalupe, like, I just start kind of just throwing information out there. So you got, you got the ledgers So I'm ledgers kind of pushing out, out the ledgers, like, like, yeah. Which are in, like, what, exercise books? Like, just notebooks? Notebooks. Boy, he came with receipts. Chop was like, yeah, I don't care about paper. Detail information on his business and how he moves with Guadalupe. Let's see if Chapo buys it. Let's see how well Guadalupe keeps records. 
So I'm opening my book. I said, first of all, sir, I thought that Lupe was kidnapped with my brother. I don't owe that money, but I know there's a problem because he said that, what? I said, they called me and said that Lupe was kidnapped with my brother. Why? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I'm lost because I know I owe some money. I've been giving payments. I've been giving regular payments. There's an old debt, but what about the shipment I just received? And he's like, but you have money. Lupe told me that you're buying houses and horse races and this and that. And I'm like, I'm guilty that. You know, I came on the run to Mexico on that. I needed to get comfortable and I figured that the little money I owed him, I'm paying him. To me, it wasn't a debt that wasn't going to be paid because I'm making payments. See, listen, you, again, yeah, you're making payments, but uh, that's a part of the slop. See, I, I, I thought about that last episode, the episode before. It's a little bit of getting sloppy, man, owing people money. These dudes get get a little resentment in them. Next thing you know, you get you on Chapo's Mountain trying to explain to him from your receipt book what's really going on. And he's looking at you like, yeah, but you super rich. Why are you owing this guy money? Where's that money? I bring my latest ledger out. I said, look, I said, sir, I just gave a payment on this date. You know, my brother got kidnapped and said, look, I just gave a payment with a vacation. And at first he's like, ah, you're, you're showing me a bunch of stuff. I could scribble on a piece of paper. I'm like, you know, I have all the accounts of the, all the deposits. I make them. I receive the, the shipments. And he's like, Lupe said that was his. And I said, Lupe doesn't have no one. Lupe has me. And he's like, Jeffrey, go give me my ledger. Nah, nah, nah. He just shit all over his receipts. And now he's going to show him his. Jeffrey runs back downstairs, comes back with a notebook. Give me that. And he opens it up. He puts it there, and he said, what was the date? I kind of w- walk around the, I said, can I? So I kind of lean over him, and I'm like, the date for the last shipment was this date, which was like a week before my brother got connected. And I'm like, here. And he's like, what day? He goes down, there's a bunch of numbers, neat numbers, and he goes down to the dates, and he goes around, and he's like, yeah. That was the day that was one of the shipments. And then, like, and then I gave a deposit here and here. Puts his hand in his chin and he's like looking at me. But one of his eyes, his right eye, it's just doesn't move. It's just like he got a lazy eye. He has this stare. He's, I know he's thinking. And he's just staring at me and I'm like, Awkward, like, so how many kilos are you actually selling? I'm like, well, I saw the kilos for you. Anywhere from, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 kilos a month for you. And I said, if you do the math, like, I can make them in a month. I just was going to tell them the truth. Like, but I'm not from here. Like, I'm from Chicago, like, I could tell. And where are you from here in Mexico? I said to them, well, listen, my father's from San Juan. You know, give me my background information. I said, my whole family lives there. And now I'm just here. And um, I've been on the run, and he kind of just real curious, asking me all kinds of questions. You know, because he asked me, how old are you? You know, stuff like that. Like, where are you from? I know that town, you know? And what does your family do? I sell drugs. That's it? I'm like, basically. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry to say, but. Somebody owes me some money. That money's owed to me. Like, the one responsible for that money is Herman Rolivares. And I'm not going to forgive that debt. The only thing I could tell you is that you could try to work it out with him. But you have money. Pay it. Pay it $10 million. And he said, there's no money that's worth losing your brother. 
I just lost mine, and I would pay whatever it is to just get my brother back. Hmm. What's this appointment? Then when you come back, we could do business. You could come work for me. I could give you drugs. We could keep making money together. I'm just like, sir, I appreciate you telling me that. Right now, the only thing I'm worried about is getting my brother back. That, oh, okay. That's it, like, yes, sir, okay. And he's like, I yeah, pay the money, but I'll arrange a meeting so you could meet Olivares and you could work it out with him. And, you know, I'm gonna find out a little bit why is he saying that. So just see what you could do, come back and see me. Like, go work it out with them and then come back and see me. And uh, he said, Did Chapir take that watch from you? Hmm. And I said, No, sir. Are you sure? I said, No, sir. I gave it to him. Why would you give it to him? I said, because he's bringing me to meet you. Like, you don't owe him nothing for this. You want your watch back? I said, no, sir. I said, it was a gift. Like, how much is that watch worth? I'm like, like 150000 That's why you don't have the $10 million. Because <laughs> you want to be giving stuff like that away. Those things won't mean nothing to me. You know, my brother's life is what means everything to me. And I just felt like whoever was helping me deserved something. And he's like, I'll get back your watch. And I'm like, no, that's... That was a little bit, like, strange to me because like, he was still being, you know, like... Pushing the issue. He didn't like the stealing part. He didn't like the somebody taking advantage part. We just made small talk. And uh, he said, excuse me for what? I think he went somewhere. He answered calls. He did something. Cause then he came back. He can't get over that. Lupe was lying. He was like, there's no way. I told him, like, just think about this. But Lupe told you that we owed him money. But yet, he's telling us that he's kidnapped too. And he asked him, Chapir, is that what he's saying? Yeah. Why? Well, that's what he told us to say. Chapo was just like, you know, put his hand in his chin, like, he whispered, like, oh, Lupe, what did you do? Like, you know, in a light voice. And then he said, I don't like liars. I'm just like quiet, like I don't like liars. I said, sir, I'm not saying that he's lying. All I'm saying is that this is a misunderstanding. And he said, you know, we're going to get to the bottom of this. And he said, I'm not letting your brother go. <laughs> Yo, Chapo drives a hard bargain, boy. He's like, yeah, sympathy, lost my brother. Oh, your brother, you do anything for him, watch, whatever. Listen, I'm not letting your brother go. Run that money, get it to Buddy over there so Buddy could pay me so I don't have to kill all three of you, including Guadalupe. But Guadalupe, he's out the picture. Buddy's gone. He tweaked already. No, I want that money. But he's like, this is what I want you to do. I'm going to send you back with a couple of my guys. And you're gonna send, you're gonna talk to him. And I was like, like, are you sure? He's gonna know now that we know he's he's lying. You're gonna put my life in danger now. He's not gonna touch you. And I was like, well, how do we know that? He said, because I said so. It didn't sit well with me. I was just envisioning, like, because I. I know him. I know what he's capable of, so. He said, I want you to go back, I want you to buy a recorder. Put it in your pocket, you put it somewhere, just, I want, I want you to talk to him. I want you to record him. I want to listen to everything he has to say. Chapo and Du must have had a decent relationship because Chapo's already called him his friend as far as Jay's telling the story. He's called him his friend already. 
and he wants unfallible proof that Guadalupe is lying. If you record him and I think he's lying, you know, we'll, we'll talk. You're gonna be in a better situation. And I was like, oh, that's easy. I want you to tell him that anything happens, I'm telling him right now, if anything happens to him or to one of you guys, whoever you send, I'm gonna wipe out his whole family. I was like, oh shit. And I was like, something I probably never thought about, especially not in that business, like recording someone. I remember thinking like, is that the way he, you know, cause he's stuck in the mountains. That the way he was able to, to like know what was true and what was not like, cause he's not able to sit with people, I guess, you know, physically all the time. Yeah, you wonder how much was being recorded during yeah. that time. And you know what, like every time, like I couldn't, he would stare at me like a lot, like sometimes it was like a more observation and sometimes it was like a thought stare, like observation. I could see him just like kind of like looking at me like, and basically it was like, okay, well, it was nice meeting you and good luck. Hopefully you get your brother back. <laughs> Hopefully. That hurt. It was almost like you were, I reached this high of thinking everything was going to work out. And I was very disappointed. Now you gotta get back in that plane. My first encounter, like meeting him, wasn't like, oh my God. I wasn't impressed. I was scared, for sure. I had been there. I'm there in person when I'm thinking like, is this the person that everyone's always talking about? Like, And he's probably looking at me like, what the fuck are you? I had all those emotions of maybe, oh my God, like I'm here. I did remember thinking, like, be careful what you wish for. I could have been a little bit, like, starstruck a little bit at the same time. One thing for sure is that he was nothing different from all the, you know, all those older men that my father had introduced me to as a kid. Went back, same route back. We were getting back kind of late. Just that whole thing, like, I was exhausted, but I was just like, I just, I was lost. I was back to square one. Like, now I met these people, but still, like, nothing changed. Yeah, you went up there and you came down without Peter. Nothing changed. All that airplane, all of that, all of that Arturo stuff, out the window. You going back. Now you got to go Best Buy, get a tape recorder, and go get this proof. Now, right, at that time, I was kind of starting to get upset at Lupe. Like, why would he do this? Now you real late as far as getting upset with Lupe. The and it kind of like started making sense. I started putting together that we owe him saying that we owe ten million dollars was because he must have received a shipment of drugs and tried to branch out without us. That didn't work out, and now he didn't have the money he needed us to actually pay the debt. And if we were going to stop receiving the same shipments from him, how was he going to pay the debt? Right, because they told him they were going to stop receiving the shipments because they had a security breach in Chicago. And he looked at it like, well, too bad. I'll make the pay and that's their problem. It was shocking to me. Like, I was disappointed. I was kind of feeling lost. And I said, maybe he's right. Maybe I should just, no matter what, pay. I went back that day and uh, Tapio said, listen, I'm going to call you. So you could ask me Olivares, where this person is. They call him Olivares. And you could talk to him. Don't worry, you're going to be okay. You're going to be good. Like, we're going to work it out. In the meantime, Peter's in the basement starving. It's like day 75. It's, I don't know, day 10, 11, 12, something like that. We made our way back. I was so happy to be able to call out. But like, babe, I'm good. It's like, what happened? You know, she's still kind of emotional. So what happened? Like, could you imagine I was there for, uh, gone for hours, like six hours or something? But you still had to go. Yeah. No, so what happened when he was yeah. like, it's not gonna, I remember telling you, it's not gonna be that easy. And I said, I guess there's a debt. Oh, that kind of explained it to her. And I said, I'm in trouble. And she's like, what? I said, I'm in trouble. Are you serious? She said, I said, yeah. And what happened is that he wasn't the nicest person. I remember telling her that. And he said, don't tell me. Don't tell me anything. Yeah. I said, I'm gonna keep working. And we got, there's a couple of hurdles, but. We're going to work it out. Chapo asked me to go and to record Lupe, the man that has, you know, was responsible for putting me in this problem. And 
Now I understand. It's not going to be a nice meeting. And I have to go. I can't say no. I'm going to leave my brother behind. Like, then I'm going to look like a liar. And I said, let's go. Uh, I'm going to go to Radio Shack. Oh, yeah. Ain't no Best Buy. It's Radio Shack season. And I bought these little recorders, RCA recorders. I bought one. I kind of like asked the guy, how does this work? And he kind of showed me how it worked. And they had a USB. It has a USB. It was a digital one. Okay, you know, I'll take it. Let's see if he uses this tactic in the future. Let's see if Chopper didn't put him up on game on how they move down there. It's, you know, just a little bit, a bit smaller, smaller than a than phone. An iPhone. Yeah, and it's kind of like what, uh, half the size and in, in width yeah. of an iPhone. I buy the recorder, I, I start like, like messing with it. And I'm thinking that this meeting is going to happen like soon. A few days, whatever, how many days pass and finally we get the call like it's going to happen today. So that means multiple days pass before this meeting happens. This is after they take him. This is after he'd been there for 10 days. Then after the 10 days, Junior went to Chapo's. Chapo sent him back. Now it's more days. The guards over there dying to kill Peter, I'm sure. And Peter's probably starving. So he's like, okay, we'll, we'll be there in half an hour. I still remember him saying, we're going in peace, right? We're going to talk. And he's okay, just making sure. Hmm. And he's like, okay, let's go. Chapo made sure that his men stayed with Jay the entire time until he could figure out who was lying. So it was a team of four who headed out to Lupe's house. Happiness, Sos, Rolly, and Jay. Lupe got to know that Jay already went to see Chapo. It took a couple of days to get together what's going on, I'm sure. That gotta be a thought in Jay's head. What is Lupe knowing? What's his angle on this meeting? We take a couple cars, three cars, I think. We drive past, we actually drive a block. The road is a block away from his home that we have to drive to. Like I felt that was close to my brother, like in a weird way, because that was the last spot I know he went to. I have the recorder in my pocket. I keep testing it out. Like when we get to the house, I, there's a bunch of vehicles there. So that already kind of has me not feeling well. We're jumping out the vehicles. The gate's there. As soon as we walk into the gated part, all of us, the doors open. A bunch of men come out with AR-15s. They have police uniforms on. AR-15, like, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Lupe comes to the door. He has a, his 45, his 1945 stuck on his head his son right behind him. They have like six men, seven men. They have a couple of their security but These are six, seven, like federal police or judiciales, right? State police from another state. They are, we all put our hands up. Lupe got all his muscle outside for a peaceful meeting. A meeting that he kept reassuring, this is peaceful, right? And he sees Japones. Mm. And they said, not him. And Japones like, listen, not anyone. Not anyone. We come in peace, like we come to talk. And I have orders that no one touches. Now I'm just nervous. So, Lupe had a massacre waiting. And if not for Japones, a massacre would have been. I have the recorder in my pocket. You know, they're gonna search me. I kind of like back step. And then he's like, we need to talk. They're fine. He said, they're fine. Well, I need to talk to you guys. Like, let me talk to you. Let me come inside. Let me talk. Lupe walks inside and we stay in that little porch area and guns pointed at us. What the fuck did, just, did I just do? Lupe comes back out. He said, okay, listen, we're going to talk. He comes back out. We're going to talk. I guess the person in charge of that is kind of pointing the AR-15 at me. So he says, turn around. You know, he kind of taps me, turn around. And he just swat the back of my pants, the front of my pants, and he doesn't go on my jeans pants. I have the recording in my pocket. And then he's turning around. He kind of nudges me. And the other guys are searching. When he was patting you, were yeah. you like, oh? Well, I was hoping, like, hopefully they're so stupid they don't even know what it is, right? It could be a phone, right? In a weird way, also, when I would hear him say, Chapo said, 
we're here to talk, chat with Santa, you know, like, it kind of like made me feel like I was safe. Top of says, right? Kind of comfort kills, bro. The door's open. I've been to his house plenty of times. Lupe looks at me. And he's breathing loud. And, and I just nodded my head and he... He reached out his hand to shake it. <laughs> yeah, because he was there to kill you. Japones being there had to calm him down. He breathing heavy. He, he was prepared for a massacre. And I shook his hand. And he's like, you know, he's breathing like, under his nose really like hard and like an angry way. It's since he's in the like foyer area, like we have to kind of scoot over, you know, to let everyone in. And here comes Sos and Roly. And he extends his hand to Sos. And Sos says, get the fuck out of here. Mm. And he pulled that gun. You're gonna be back me my motherfucking house, motherfucker. Loop about that action, boy. Put the 1911 in his face. And they're like, hey, hey, you know, like, stop, 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 stop. Like, you know, come on, just stop. Tap on this. It's just like, so it's just chill. He's like, nah, that's bullshit. Like, you're gonna respect me. And he's talking to me like, nah, come on, Lord. Like, how am I gonna respect you? How am I gonna respect you? This is bullshit, like, you know? And I'm just like, just chill. Just chill, you know? Commotion. Hapun is like still trying to be like, listen, just calm down. He just kind of turns his hand away. So they kind of guide me to, to the dining room. And he puts the, the gun to my like back. Like he's making sure that I'm feeling the gun in my side. They sat me in the head of the table. There's barely enough room for the gunman to kind of like, he had to pull his gun back to kind of like have enough room. And then he just put it right in the back of my head. The whole time he just had it there. It started off like this. I said, look, why did you do this? Just like that. And he like, shut the fuck up. I had never seen him like that. Like, shut the fuck up. And he got in my face. He's pissed. And I just kind of tried to ignore him, and they just started talking. I was like, why would you do this? I don't understand. It's, I don't owe you that money. And he's like, yes, you fucking do, mother. Like, and shouting. I'm like, let's go. He's going to drown out the doubt with his anger and his rage and try to drown out the fact that he did this. Reality is reality. You can scream as loud as you want. You pulled the move on, though. Well, let's look at the numbers. I don't understand why would you do this. This kind of went on for a while. I'm, he's been recorded, so I know. So I'm kind of trying to provoke that conversation from him. The meeting went on for like an hour and a half of just commotion. In the beginning, I was a little bit timid, but I just said, fuck it, man. Like, maybe Chapel's men, they kind of gave me that confidence. But I just got upset, and I just started shouting back. I was just like, that's some fucking bullshit. Why the fuck did you come and say that you were kidnapped too? If I'm, if I'm supposed to owe you this money, why didn't you just fucking come get me? You know where the fuck I live? Like, I'm swearing. And at one point, Lupo took his gun out and hit me. Ah. That's it. You sealed your fate right there, Lupe. Because uh, hands-off policy was a hands-off policy. He kind of missed me, but he... It was with his left hand. He took it off his hip. I went, like, all that one motion and hit me over my head. And when he did that, everyone got up and like, don't fucking touch him, don't touch him. The barrel of the gun went into my neck. I think it settled me like, I was like, oh shit. Back to reality, like, it was like a lot of screaming, a lot of commotion. He said, I'm not gonna let your fucking brother go. He said, I'll kill him before I let him go. He said, and as a matter of fact, you're gonna bring me the fucking money. I want my money here. He said, go and get your money. You have it. You fucking have a lot of money. You made it. I seen you make the money. All these houses and all these fucking horses. Well, Lupe, you could have had him do that before. But they would have fought you back. You went the, you went the sneaky route. You could have just ran up on him and said, you owe me bread, run my money now. You didn't do that. Now I see the jealousy. I'm like, what the fuck is it to you what I buy with my money? I'm like, like he's just throwing all these things at me, like jealousy. You showed everybody you're safe. 
You showed everybody what you had. You flaunted it. I started to just let it, let things go. And I felt like I had enough on the recording to like, say, okay. Like I was done. We got up, but I kind of sensed that over the time, that barrel of the gun kind of started kind of loosening it up a little bit. I went to shake Lupus hand and he, he turned away. And I was like, all right. I shook all the guys' hands there that was there. They walked us out with the guns still raised. And we left. Just all these thoughts were just going through. I have the recording. I remember jumping in the truck. I stopped the recording. The recording was going for like, I think like two hours almost. I hope that shit didn't pop. I tried to play it back and I kind of heard things I didn't want to hear. Like, I'm not even going to listen to this. So we make our way back to Culiacan with the recording. Back to the trip. So more days, more planes, more uphill, downhill landing strips, and Peter still starving in the basement. To see Chapo. This time Chapo has actually army fatigues on. And Tim's, he has Tim boots and army fatigues. He greets me the narco way, you know, hey, like different, like now a little bit more, you know, he's familiar. You know, how are you? Like nice and he tells me, uh, you guys got the recording? Yeah. And he takes the recording from us. And uh, he's like, I don't even know how to work it. So I kind of grabbed it and I just kind of went, you know, started to kind of, it has that little, like, what, 15 seconds forward, a small forward button. I kind of look for that conversation. I just let it play. I'm not going to let your fucking brother go. I'll kill him before I let him go. And as a matter of fact, you're going to bring me the fucking money. I want my money here. Go and get your money. You have it. You fucking have a lot of money. You made it. I seen you make the money. And you're going to come buy all these houses and all these fucking horses. And why would you do this? I don't understand. And he listened to recording. He just was like kind of lost in the recording. Shut the He listened to it. And he kind of shut it off. He was like, Oh, Lupe, you lied to me. We're going to have to take care of that. But since you've been gone, you know, I, I talked to, you know, a couple of the people, and no matter what happens, you got to pay that money. You're going to have to pay that money. He looked at me, he said, Listen, I just lost my brother not so long ago. It had been a few months. They had shot his brother while he was in prison. They shot him in prison. He said, I'll give all the money in the world to have my brother back. Obviously, you're making money. Yeah, run that money. Obviously, you have nice things. Pay the money. Pay the money. You have your brother back. And then we'll get back to work. In my head, I'm like, this is bullshit. This is supposed to be a, you know, the business I know from Mexico is supposed to be what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. And I just showed you that was right. And he just strung on you out of 10. He said, listen, man, just pay the freight. I'm going to smoke Lupe. I'm not going to get it from Lupe. So Lupe's paying with his life, and you're paying for your brother. It didn't matter. He said, I'm going to put you in contact with some people that are going to collect the money from you. Just work it out. Get your brother back. And then we could do business. I basically thanked. Okay, thank you. What was I going to do with him? I said, appreciate it. And right then and there, I just said, all right, you know what? I'm just going to focus on paying back this money. So I started collecting money, started making payments. I think I had given him like $6 million. It was taking me some time, like I'm collecting money, you know. How much time? Because buddy's still starving in the basement. How much time? The hardest part is to collect like all the money off the street. We had just finished paying a, a debt, you know, from the last seizure. But we're living, right? Still, I'm thinking, yeah, our company's taking a hit, but we're living. We probably had spent $10 million in just setting up in Mexico. It's taking me a little bit of time, and my brother's still tied up. And then next thing you know, he's like, it went from being okay to like, your brother's not doing well. And he was like, listen, your, your brother's sick. 
And I remember saying, like, sick of what? He like, I think it's his liver or something. The question is, does Lupe have the brother? Because Chapo's going to take care of Lupe. You're paying the money. Who are you paying it to? Are you, but, but at this point, are we bypassing Lupe? Are we paying the money to Chapo? Or are you still paying this money to Lupe? Like, what's really happening here? And where's your brother? Who has him in the basement? Does Chapo have him in the basement? Or does Lupe have him in the basement? Because after $6 million, you think Chapo would have been like, all right, here's your brother. Run that four. I guess dehydration. He's not well, so you need to hurry. And I remember, like, I was getting anxious. I was like, listen, I'm going to give you my word. I'm going to pay you every dollar. But I'm short, I think, like, $4 million. I have around $3 million worth of jewelry that you could hold. I'm not asking you to take it. I'm asking you to hold it. And then I'll pay you back the money. He said, you know, usually when we take that, we want double. And I said, listen, I'll give you a deed. You know, I have a deed for a $3 million house and the jewelry. He said, all right, I'm going to send my brother to look at the stuff. And I remember, I'm like, all right, we kind of set up. And I told Val, Vivi, and brought all the jewelry on the table. Listen, we're going to give him the jewelry, but we're going to be fair. I don't care I spent. 500,000 on something. We're going to be really fair. We're not going to over ask or over value something. I used to have those insecurities. I used to do dumb things because you could. Who I am today and at times, I never changed who I was, but sometimes, like, you know how people get drunk and they act stupid? Well, my drunk was a little bit like having money. You know, my drunkness. So I, I might be like, be happy when they spend 500000 in jewelry. Christmas will come and I, we, we could spend a million dollars on gifts. Wow. Not for me, for my associates, for my workers, just gifts. The jeweler came in handy there. Because I remember they, he brought a jeweler with him mm. to appraise the jewelry. And I'll never forget when he was seeing the big pieces. And he whispered something, shh. And he's like, could you give me a minute? In my house, I walked away. He's like, sure. And he came back. He said, hey, we have a problem. Some of these things are way more than, you know, Val had put tags on them. Tags on every little piece. So some of these pieces are way more, worth more than what you've talked about. What you said, I said, listen. Question is, who's there? Whose brother is there? Is it Lupe's brother? Who's there with the jeweler? Who are they doing this deal with? I'm not here to play games. I know they are. I just wanted to be fair. And then they looked at me like, like, oh, okay. He only saw, like, he didn't see all the pieces. After that, they were like, yeah, let's not even think about it. Let's yeah, just, they're like, run the bag now. Let's just take it. So they just grabbed it. Like, okay, like, they didn't have finish seeing it. After that, they took my word, like, and I remember he called his brother, he said, Hey, I'm here with this guate, you know? He said, you're going to be surprised. He undervalued all the jewelry, so he, if he tells you he has four, it's really more, but all right. He got $4 million worth of jewelry, and he has a deed here for a big-ass house. The next day, I get a call early in the morning. It's Olivares. He says, Hey. Listen, your brother's not well. And he said... So it was Olivares then. Okay. So Lupe owed the money to Olivares. Olivares owed, owed the money to Chapo. Evidently, Olivares is the one who's holding up Peter. I already gave you over $10 million in jewelry, deeds, and money. Run my brother already. Like, what am I doing this for? Listen, your brother's not well. And he said... Everything that, you know, I've known of you... Seems like you're, you're a man of your word. And that, that says a lot. He said, I don't want your house. I don't want your jewelry. I want my money. Now you give me your word that you're going to pay me back my money. And I'll let your brother go today. He said, it's Mother's Day. I couldn't even imagine what your mom was feeling. 
Fool, I thought I was getting my brother back when I gave you the, the jewelry and the deed. Your mom should have a, a good Mother's Day. And I said, you're putting me in a situation that anyone in my situation will give you the word. But I mean that. You have my word. Olivares just don't want to do dying on his watch. If he's going to die, he want him to die at Jay's crib. He want the responsibility of the dead twin in his basement. So now he's willing to take his word for it. After I just gave you jewels, I just gave you a deed. Not because I don't have a choice, because I want my shit back. And he was like, all right, I'll get back to you. And hung up. I remember he called an hour later and he said, could you believe this fucking old man don't want to let your brother go? Who was he referring to? Tulupe. I thought Olivares had more juice than that. Olivares or whatever his name, Olivera. I thought he had more juice than that with, with Lupe. I got sick. Like, I was in pain. I had, like, a really sharp pain on my right side of my stomach. I remember just having all those, those deep emotions in my heart. Like, I remember hearing him, they were going to bring me a doctor. Thinking, what kind of doctor comes and treats a captive person? At least they're not letting me die. And then once they see me in like a really bad condition, maybe around the 14th day, they come straight to offer me food that they cook. After the 14th day. You know, it's like, you gotta eat. You're gonna die, you're gonna try to make it up. I could see you, you're not looking good. And then he tells me, and I've seen people die like this. Okay, thanks. But I couldn't eat. Like my, by that time, my appetite was. You're not eating for two weeks. Yeah, I couldn't even eat, but. He bought me some the Mexican like cookies with the marshmallow and the cocoa on them, you know? And I remember like trying to eat some and he bought me some Gatorade and there's been a little more like like there was no sense that him keep torturing me. Like he's looking at me probably like, yeah, you're not looking too good. And this whole time were they like trying to get get anything out of you? No, nah, the only no, thing they said is I work for Chapel Mile. Like no. You know who Chapel Mile? And that's what struck me as weird. I wouldn't say much, you know? And I could hear the radios and chat on the radios and stuff. That dude was going through torture, sitting there, just being watched. No talking, no eating, just drink this water and, and rot away right there. And, you know, they're in their combat boat and they have their full, you know, army gear. And I'm just, just sitting there. One night, like two in the morning, I hear a lot of commotion. And I was just like, oh shit, what's going on, yeah? They get me up, like, come on, get up. And I realized how weak I felt and how fatigued I felt. Walked me out. They pulled me back in the truck. They drive me. They drive me. Whoa. And they, I see, you know, it's dark, completely pitch dark. The roads don't have lights, like, you know, street lights and highway lights. And they veer off the road again to another bumpy road for like maybe 10 minutes. What were you thinking at that time? That was scary. I was probably the scariest. They finally stopped. They pulled me out. He walks me towards the back of the vehicle. I see the red of the brake lights. I get me out. And I'm just kind of standing there. And he kicks me in the back of the knees. In that moment, I was like, there's a hole somewhere. I remember thinking, like, I'm not even, I'm not even going to say nothing. I'm going to hold my peace and just, Whatever happens does not matter here, you know? Just thinking about my brother, feeling so much regret at the same time. A little bit of peace. But sad to think like that's the way you live your life, your short life. I don't think anyone's ready for that, you know? Once that happens, 
I feel I'm doing something to my back pocket. I feel I'm doing something, you know what I mean? I feel I'm messing with my shoes, you know? I remember thinking like, I wish I had a paper and pen, like I could write my name down and put my own name in my shoes. So if someone ever finds me, they know who I am. And he grabs my hand, he like presses. They both had the thought in their head roughly around the same time while Peter's going through this and while Jay was going through his flight, they both had the unknown soldier, unknown dead body kind of thought like, I don't want to just be out here and nobody know where the hell I am or find me and don't know who the hell I am. Like presses a piece of paper, like, like I'm handcuffed in the front and he presses a piece of paper and he tells me, you're lucky. This is your brother's phone number. He saved your life. Look, don't get up. Count to 100. No, he been there before. Don't turn around. Don't make me come back. Count to 100. And I'm just thinking to myself, is this really happening? Is he really gonna let me go? I hear the vehicle move away. And I'm like right away searching for help. You know, handcuffs, like, I, I know he put the key in my thing, and he did. It's black, and I can't even see, so with my hand, I could feel that. And he put a phone in my pocket. And I'm, like, trying to, like, do everything at the same time. I'm panicking. I'm trying to grab the phone, take the cuffs out. I remember just taking, like, composure stuff a little bit, too. The only phone he gave me was, like, uh, you know, like a thirty-dollar Nokia phone with a flash on it. That's like the first phone that came out with the little flash on the top. You press clear twice, and I couldn't see nothing. It was completely pitch black. Like I couldn't see the hand from my face. Like it was like, am I blind? It was just so dark, you know. There's no light. You know, it took me a little bit to look up in the sky. I could see stars. And finally, like find a way to remove the cuffs. And I hear, like, animals around me, you know? Like, moving around, like... I can't see them, I can just see them. I can see one street, like, far away, at least a mile away. I can see, like, the shape of a, the shadow of a building. I don't know where I'm at. I'm looking at the phone. I was like, I know he went that way, I think, but I'm not even sure where just that way it was. And, I'm like, I'm gonna walk towards the street and see if someone can help me, see if someone can help me, like, at least where I'm at. So it's like three, four in the morning. I'm walking. No service. Feeling so tired. That's an extra kick in the nuts. They put a phone in your back pocket. They give you the key. You get the wherewithal to figure it all out, get it all done, and now you ain't got no service. They didn't think of that one. Not the dude die in the street. Now they're on the hook for that, too. I literally would sit on the floor and just hear animals around me. And, like, I'm thinking it's cattle grazing or something. Like, you know, I'm kind of walking down the hill. So dark and so tired. I'm so tired, like, I couldn't move. Like, I kept thinking, like, I've never felt this fatigued in my life. Like, I can't even pick my legs up. Then I could hear dogs barking, 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 barking. And then as I'm getting close, I see, like, a big herd of dogs, like, and I'm like, grabbing big old rods and things like, these dogs didn't kill me, right? And walking, and I see a couple little houses, like, one-room houses, and that building was, like, a small school. I remember looking at the name of the school. And I'm like, kind of like knocking on their fence, like, excuse me, like, can someone help me? Nobody will come up. I can imagine how that is. So I'm, that's another thing to imagine how I look. Right, looking crazy, skinny, a mess, tired, dragging your feet. I said, this ain't gonna work. I'm gonna walk back the other way. Ah. But that was like an uphill. It literally took me like, I don't know, now we're gonna for something. Wow, and I look in the phone and I'm walking and see getting a little signal. My phone rings. 
I just remember hearing my brother's voice. At that time, it kind of felt like forever. And just hearing his voice was like, like relief for me. I don't even think that I even was able to feel anything then. I couldn't, right? But it felt good to be able to hear his voice and, you know, I'm like, where are you? And he's like, I don't know. I'm so weak. I can't even, I can't even walk. I see a light far away. I'm going to walk towards the light. And then he would take breaks after like three steps. I see a light. I'm going to guess that that's maybe a, a light on the road or something. It's just so dark. I'm just scared. And I remember him saying, I thought I was going to die. There's still time. I kind of didn't want him to even say that. I was like, you're not. You're going to be okay, son. You're good now. Hurry up, come. I don't know where I'm at. And I said, I know that you're somewhere by Lupus Ranch. Mm. So I'm just going to head that way. Mm. I remember, like, you know, now I'm driving slow. And I'm like, listen... How do I know where you're at? I'm like, to me, reality is for me. It's like, I could be, you know, in another state. You're in another state. I don't even know. I'm going to turn on my hazard lights and flash my lights. Hmm. Could you see anything? And he was like, I see you. That's crazy. Bro, you are so far away. You're somewhere else. You're so far away. What? Keep flashing, keep flashing. We had a hang up because like, the battery's low. He said, I need to see the battery. Because he was using the flashlight. And he'd call me and I'd flash my lights and turn on my hands. He's like, You're getting closer. You're getting closer. Took me a good 40 minutes. When I finally like, got to him, I remember getting to the light where he was at and I kind of just stopped the truck in the middle of the road and I looked and he was trying to walk up. I just seen a different person. And he was like, we're already small. He was small. He was like unrecognizable to me. He was filthy. And when we got up, you know, up the truck and we just hugged. These fools found each other through a Twin psychic link and hazard lights. And kissed, and he was like, I thought I was gonna die. I thought I was not gonna ever see you again. And he's just like holding me, like, he's small. I'm talking about, he probably, oh, he's probably weighing 120. He probably left at 170, came back at 120. His eyes are just sunken in. I felt like I was looking at death. Like, that's how it looked. And he can't stay up where I'm kind of, like, holding him, man. I'm hugging him. We're crying. And, and I said, we have to go. And he's like, what about Lupe? Mm. Is he okay? Wow. He still thinks he's kidnapped. What about Lupe? Is he okay? Lupe's a piece of shit. Peter? Sorry to break it to you. Theo's a piece of shit. I said, don't worry about Lupe. And you know, he's like, what? I open the door, help him in the truck, and he has this, like, really loud, I'm talking about, like, his stench is, like, unbearable. I'm trying to hold back, like, me gagging, you know? Like, how did it sound like? Every imaginable thing you could think of, like just, just a bad smell, just, just awful smell. He was locked in a room, I guess, in the summertime, where he couldn't get off the bed, and he was blindfolded for twenty something days. Twenty something days, wild. I remember he jumped in the car. He. Sat backwards on that 
head rest. I just, I just want to hold you. And I'm driving. He just like hugging me, rubbing his head, like you know, rubbing his head. He's just like rubbing his head against you. Yeah. Just holding on to you while you're driving. And his beard was long, big beard. Like I think I was gonna see you. Like they're gonna kill me, say. And he was like, you know, he acts about everyone. He, he's like, they're okay, they're okay, you know. And he was like, what happened? You don't want to know. And your brother don't want to lay that on you yet. I'm in a chapel. All right, y'all, we made it to the end of episode six. And Peter is alive. Uh, he didn't starve to death in the basement. Very close to it. Um... If you ask me, they sent him home because they didn't want his death on their hands, especially after getting the amount of money that they already had and the jewelry and all of the collateral that they gave him. Both brothers were suffering two different things at the same time, one suffering the starvation and the isolation and the, the, the kidnapping and the other one, the stress of meeting the top of the food chain and being asked to deliver for top of the food chain and the top of the food chain making it very, very clear that he will smoke everybody if this does not go the way he wants it to go. They were still on the hook for the 10 million. They gave up collateral. They still didn't want to give up the brother. Brother's dying on his own accord. They finally give up the brother. And there we are. Jay got Peter in the car and they're on their way. Hope you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel. See y'all next time. Peace.